All right, so I've split these lectures into two. So we've got toxinology on land creatures and then on sea creatures. So they're both reasonably short. So um, the venom that you get in, in both uh, will fall into one of three categories and cause one of three problems. Either it will cause, the venoms will cause wise, widespread coagulopathy. And you normally see that uh, on the mucous membranes first. So people have like bleeding gums and things like that. Um, the most concerning one is that they can have a neurotoxicity and that can present quite broadly. It can either present as over or under stimulation. So patients may be tachycardic hypotensive or bradycardic hypotensive and most concerningly can present with a paralysis. Um, and you can have a direct myopathy. So uh, the, where the venom directly causes muscle breakdown and muscle weakness. So snake bites are usually um, coagulopathic. Um, as I said before, you, one of the early signs will be bleeding in the gums of a serious envenomation. Um, and that can lead to cardiac arrest, is that widespread diffuse coagulopathy. And unfortunately, those patients don't tend to have good outcomes. If you do have a cardiac arrest from a snake bite, early transport is indicated because there have been cases where um, the rapid administration of antivenom uh, has uh, helped to resolve the arrest. We obviously don't carry the antivenom, they need to get to hospital. Snake bite can also be neurotoxic. Uh, and that kills by respiratory paralysis. Important for us because that's a very correctable problem. If it's recognized, uh, you just have to ventilate the person and they'll be paralyzed and intubated in hospital because the paralysis can last several days. So if you get a snake bite patient, don't wash the bite site. Um, when you take them to hospital, they'll swab the, the site and uh, there'll be remnants of the venom. They'll be able to find out exactly what snake bit them. But if you have washed all the venom off, then they can't do that. Then you want to apply a pressure immobilization bandage. Now the way to do this is to first put a, a so it's a, you need two bandages. You put the first one directly over the bite site like a normal bandage, very tight. Then you put a second bandage up and down the entire length of the limb. Um, there is no clear research on exactly what is the best way to apply that bandage. As long as the limb ends up fully, um, fully bandaged and then immobilized with a splint uh, best practices has been achieved uh, pending ongoing research. The reason that that works is that um, venom moves through your, your lymphatic system and your lymphatic system is easily compressible. So if you squash all your lymph vessels down, the venom will have a really hard time moving. Um, muscle movement is also one of the things that pushes lymph along through your body. So if you immobilize the limb, the venom's gonna have a hard time moving again. So you immobilize, don't let them walk or move. General care is you monitor the ECG because of that risk of cardiac arrest and hemodynamics for that rare hemodynamic collapse. If they start to uh, hyperventilate or get respiratory failure or paralysis, you ventilate them. So spider bite, there's only really two that are hugely problematic in Australia, the funnel web and the red back. In Queensland, you're really only likely to see the red back. Um, they, you're not gonna have a good day if you get bit by one, but unless you're a baby or a small child, you're not gonna die from it as an adult. The presentation is very varied, particularly with redbacks. People may not realize they've been bitten um, and uh, you're gonna to have to be quite the detective to pick it off the uh, very non-specific symptoms that they develop. Um, if uh, a funnel web is one that people may realize they've been bitten by, it's a huge spider and it's got big fangs and it'll actually leave puncture marks. So if people describe that sort of history of big black spider clear puncture marks, um, you can be a bit more confident that you're looking at a funnel web spider bite then. Um, useful to know the difference because a pressure bandage is indicated for a, a funnel web, but not for a red back. Red back um, invenovation rarely becomes systematic. It tends to just stay in the one spot anyway. And finally, last slide, uh, other insects. So bee and wasps things very common. The only way that they're ever fatal is if they cause anaphylaxis. And if a person does get anaphylaxis from a bee or a wasp sting, you just treat it normally, adrenaline fluids, trip to hospital. Um, just remember with bee stings, many of you probably know, when a bee stings you, it tends to leave the stinger in and the stinger will continue to inject uh, venom. So make sure that you do uh, remove the stinger. Uh, we unfortunately have paralysis ticks in Australia. Again, it's mostly a problem with children. Um, if you can find the tick, uh, if a patient is symptomatic or even if they've just realized they've been bitten by a ting, it, tick, it is appropriate to remove it if you're confident to do so. The way to do it is to get a, something like a string or fishing line make a loop in it and slide it over the, the tick and then tighten it around uh, the base. So between the tick and the skin, that'll tend to grab the mouthpiece, mouthpieces of the, the tick too and then you can remove it. 
If you just pull the tick out, it will usually leave its mouthpieces in, which will continue the envenomation.